Education reform is a top priority for lawmakers this year as they face a judge's April deadline to present a plan to make massive changes to the entire school system. Judge Sarah Singleton issued that deadline last year after ruling that the state had failed its constitutional obligation to offer a quality education to all students, including those most at risk. Now, as we continue to follow the proposals, we wanted to look back on exactly what Judge Singleton found and why we are in the position we are in right now. Mexican Focus special correspondent Sarah Gustava sat down with one of the plaintiffs in that court case, Wilhelmina Yazi, as well as a lawyer with the Center on Law and Poverty. Here's just a sample of what Ms. Yazi's experience was and why she decided the time for drastic change is now. Well, Homina, I want to start with you. Your son was in middle school in Gallup when the lawsuit started. What concerns did you have about the quality of education he was receiving? Uh, well, actually, my son was um, in um, elementary fifth grade when it started. When it started? Yeah. That far back? That okay. far back, yeah. So, you know, as a concerned parent, um, my child at the time um, wasn't, I felt like he wasn't receiving um, the adequate and the sufficient resources that he needed in order for him to be successful. And especially going into mid school and on to high school, um, I wanted him to be, you know, uh, college ready, pre be prepared for life outside when he gets older. And then as a Native American woman, a Navajo, um, we consider our children very sacred. And that's one of our primary responsibilities to our children that we um, make sure that we uh, teach them the correct, you know, um, principles of life and also um, to protect them. That's our primary responsibility for our children. And that is why, you know, I, have, I had some concerns within the schools that he was attending, um, just to make sure that he ensured the, um, that he received the quality education that he was entitled to. Were you concerned even in elementary school that he was maybe falling behind? Well, actually, my son um, was actually doing very well. He was getting good grades and doing, you know, um, doing very well, but then when it came to testing, he fell below the passing uh, grade level. And that was a little, you know, concerning for me because he was doing really good, but when it came to testing, he wasn't doing so good and he wasn't like where he's supposed to be at. So that right there was, you know, a big flag for me and thinking, okay, well, you know, what is it that he needs to, in order for him to get um, past you know, the testings. Um, so from there, you know, it's just more resources that he'll need. And then also with, um, you know, with our cultural, he'll, with the cultural, you know, um, relevant learning environment that he needs with you know, the language that we speak at home, of course, you know, and um, those kind of barriers that he needs to be assisted with, I guess. Did you feel heard when you went to the school to talk with him about your son's education? Um, several times, you know, I've always gone to my the parent-teacher conferences. That was one thing I always wanted to go just to make sure how make sure that my son was um, doing what he's supposed to be doing, you know, behavior-wise and also educational, academic-wise that he was passing, doing what he's supposed to be doing, and so forth. So at one point, um, you know, my son was doing very good, getting good grades, honor roll, so what. I was kind of concerned that he wasn't placed in like um, more advanced classes. So I brought that up to one of the counselors, you know, how does a child or one of the student, how, how do you determine that, de how they get to an advanced um, class? I didn't really get any answers. It was just basically, you know, well, we look at your child's grades and we look at the testing. And it was a bit confusing for me, but you know, I kind of just left at that and thought, you know, and I always told Xavier, you know, always do your best anyway. Just keep doing your best. And um, other other concerns that I had was um, like textbooks. Um, he wasn't able to bring any textbooks home from school to do homework. And of course, they always had homework. Um, he shared textbooks. Um, sometimes some of the instructors or teachers um, was nice enough to, you know, make copies maybe on their own. Of, certain sections that they're covering. So that was helpful. Um, other things I saw was uh, maybe technology, um, limited technology. And that was, and then it's not just for my son, it's actually for like other children in our communities in the state and the nation, especially those that are um, going to school in the real, rural areas. Um, we have very limited access to a lot of the resources that my son had in the, you know, the bigger towns. 
Mm -hmm. Now is another thing. I have family and I have friends have, that have children that go to these rural area schools. Um, and same thing, limited textbooks, materials. Um, and then with the technology, you know, improving and all that, um, they have limited access to Wi-Fi, you know, such things like that. So that was, a, a you know, um, some concerns that I had with Xavier. And most importantly, it was just basically making sure that he's prepared when he gets, you know, after high school that he hopefully graduates because, you know, with the testing, um, with him um, go, going below the grade level, it's a bit concerning and I want him to pass and I want him to graduate. I want him to get, you know, to college and my son has dreams, you know, he, he has big dreams. He wants to go to a big college. He wants a career. He wants to do this and that and, you know, and I think when, you know, within our culture, um, education is a very important thing. Um, so that that's pretty much. Yeah. yeah. What made you decide to make that leap into being part of this lawsuit? So those are the concerns that I had for yeah. my child. And of course, every other child in the state and in our community, and mm. especially with us within the Native American. Um, another thing that pushed me was um, my mom was an educator for 30 plus years. She was a teacher and education was one of the most important thing in our family. And she always pushed us, me and my siblings, you know, pushed us to go get, go to school, get your education. And during, you know, my school years, we we're very limited. Um, I, you know, I experienced that and I know how that is. And, um, you know, so Education one is one of the most important. Another thing is, um, you know, with our culture and our history, one of our great warriors, uh, Chief Manley told back then, you know, had told, that did a quote, I don't know if it's precisely right, but, you know, said, you know, my grandchildren go out and climb the ladder of education, go succeed so you can come back and help our people, help our nation. And that was one thing, you know, was set in our family was that education was very important. So that's why, um, I became, you know, a plaintiff in this suit, um, just primarily the reason that my son deserved the quality education that he needs to, in order to succeed. In order to reach those dreams that he has for yes. himself. Yes. Absolutely. Pressed in this lawsuit is actually two combined lawsuits that the judge ruled on. It includes Native American <coughs> students, also economically disadvantaged students, English language learners, students with disabilities. That seems very broad. What does that mean from a, in, in putting up a lawsuit like that? Is that, was that a challenge, an additional challenge to have it include so many students? Well, you know, so the take that we have is, our, our position in this case is that all students have the potential to learn. All students have um, the potential to learn and is just as great in terms of their potential as other states, as other nations. Um, and so, the thing that's happening here in New Mexico, though, is that they're starved of resources. They're starved of educational opportunities to succeed academically, as uh, Wilhelmina has described. Um, and so putting together this case meant that we had to sort of think about the needs of all students. And the students of, you know, students have different needs. English language learner students have uh, needs in, when it comes to ling English language acquisition programs. Uh, economically disadvantaged students tend to have needs around socio-emotional um, um, career counseling kind of needs um, and then American Indian students as well share a, uh, a, a history of discrimination by education systems that has to be addressed uh, through the education system today and so we sought to sort of capture all of those needs as well as just the general needs of, of public school districts in New Mexico. Well, Hamina mentioned a lack of textbooks. I mean, it sounds like there's part of this lawsuit is just the actual materials of the state needing to provide more funding for textbooks, for technology, for computers, things like that. Correct. And what about um, what about culture in the classroom? Um, there was, you know, I think that's important. We've talked about <coughs> that here on New Mexico in Focus. This need to better incorporate culture in the classroom for students. How does the lawsuit speak to that? Good question. <clears throat> um, so. The, the case, the, the court, in, in its opinion, has stated specifically for American Indian students that compliance with the New Mexico Indian Education Act is a constitutional requirement. A violation of the, of the New Mexico Indian Education Act is a, 
uh, violation of the constitutional adequacy clause. That's huge. That's huge for New Mexico students. That's huge for Native American students. Um, it, because if you look at the law itself, it re requires a constitutionally, uh, I'm sorry, it requires a culturally relevant and culturally responsive education, uh, specifically for the districts that serve high uh, populations of American Indian students. And so that's one element of this case is, is compliance with that law. But you know, the court has also addressed in its opinion uh, the Hispanic Education Act, the Bilingual Multicultural Education Act. These are all laws that provide goals for students in terms of what they should be achieving academically as well as what they should be achieving culturally. And these are all now a part of this uh, equation. And so we seek to ensure that these laws are being complied with.